On October 5th, 2003, the bells of St. Peter's heralded God's love for all people, regardless of language or culture. On this day, bells rang out for all to notice the Society of the Divine Word, a religious international missionary order that believes God is found in the many faces of the world. On October 5, 2003, the goal of the society to be a bridge between cultures was confirmed by the canonization of two of its own. The canonizations of Father Arnold Jansen and Father Joseph Freinatomitz were a sign that the Divine Word missionaries were being led by God. The bells rang out to signal official recognition that these two men lived lives of virtue worth imitating. Arnold Jensen was the founder of the Society of the Divine Word. He was German, and due to the Kulturkampf in Germany, he had to go to uh, Style, Holland, where he founded the Society in 1875. And his main idea was bringing the Word of Christ to those people who had not heard that word yet. He was very upset by the fact that there was no seminary in Germany preparing missionaries to do that kind of work. And that was his great vision, to send people out to bring the word of Christ to people who had never heard that word. And so one of the first missionaries he sent out was Father Joseph Freinatomitz to China to bring the message of Christ to that country. Joseph Freinatomitz was one of the first missionaries to China in 1879. He left his homeland of Austria for a new land, culture, language, and people that was totally different to him. It was a difficult challenge, but he responded. In the end, as he lay dying from the typhus, he contracted while ministering to the sick, Joseph said, I love China and the Chinese. I want to die among them and to be laid to rest among them. I want to continue being Chinese even in heaven. Because of these two, the work of God prospered. The signs of God's approval are found in the growth of the Divine Word missionaries, which now number over 6,000 priests and brothers working in 65 countries. God's blessing is further seen in the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters who were founded by St. Arnold and now number 3,800 sisters who serve in 42 countries and the 400 Holy Spirit Adoration Sisters in eight countries who were founded to pray specifically for the missions. The signs of God's approval reach even to our own United States of America. From Techni, Illinois, founded in 1895, the Divine Word missionaries have established houses and parishes in all parts of the United States. From these places, American Divine Word missionaries have served in all parts of the world. It was the Divine Word missionaries who made a difference in the racial struggle in this country and the church. Wherever Divine Word missionaries have gone, they have always advocated a native clergy. So it was that for the longest time, the only place young African-American men could study for the priesthood was with the Divine Word missionaries. The first African-American priest K. 
came from Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, the determination of the Divine Word missionaries made change possible within the church so that today there are no obstacles for these young men to enter religious life. The society went to the southern part of the, of the U.S. Uh, to evangelize and preach the gospel to primarily African Americans. And it's also significant because um, St. Arnold Jensen always had the idea of having a, uh, a native clergy, a clergy from that particular culture. And so the so Divine Word Seminary was, um, was established primarily to, to, to uh, train African-American young men for the priesthood. And so I think he contributed so much to the church uh, during his time, and of course his ideas are very relevant today. In both saints, one finds a living testimony that the kingdom is open to all, no matter the race, culture, or language. They recognized in the differences of people a source of enrichment and grace for the church and the world. The canonization days were witness to how this vision has touched the lives of millions throughout the world. The testimony began the night before the actual canonization ceremony. prayer vigil was an event to be remembered. At this ceremony, attended by over 6,000 people, men and women from all over the world gather and bore witness to the influence of these new saints on our world. The three and a half hour service was complete with song, chant, dance, prayer and readings presented at times in four languages. Io il Signore ti ho chiamato nella giustizia e ti ho offerto, ti ho chiamato e affermato per mano.
A gospel choir formed from the SVD parishes in the southern United States shared their faith. The men and women who made up this special choir came from various Divine Word parishes in Mississippi and Louisiana. The events of this evening demonstrated that we can live and work together in this multicultural world. People from the farthest ends of the earth are able to live together side by side. One of the requirements for canonization are miracles. God's approval is undeniable when someone owes a miraculous recovery to the intercession of a saint. So it was in the case of our two new saints. He started his studies in early Christian art under Father Falzoni at Nunzen University. He enrolled in, 19, in the school year of 19, uh, 1986, and in 1987, in March, he fell sick, went to the hospital, and was diagnosed as having acute leukemia. And the doctors tried everything. It went from his, from the, uh, the, uh, the liver, the kidneys, everything was affected. And no medicine could help in any way. But the interesting thing was that he always said when he was conscious, was unconscious for a long time, but when he was conscious he said, I will walk out of this hospital on my own feet. And uh, his hospital room was one kilometer away from our seminary. And uh, the seminary has a tower with a light in it. So they, every time they went to chapel to pray their prayers in the evening, they would light that light and he would see that. And he says, they, the fathers and the seminarians are praying for me. And he was so bad that already the funeral preparations were being made for his burial. But then they asked his brother, who was studying here in the States, to come over so he could at least see him before he died. And his brother says, don't take the tubes out, leave them in yet. And two days later, he was conscious, started talking, and recovered. when they examined her said that she would either die or be a vegetable for the rest of her life. Now the very interesting thing there is that her grandmother with whom she was staying in Baguio City immediately went to the Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, the Missionary Sisters of Perpetual Adoration founded by Arnold Jansen 
ask them to pray and ask for novena booklets. And then she got her whole family together and said, look, now all of you go to confession and you go to Mass every day and communion and you say this prayer, we'll say this prayer together every day for nine days. And it was during that time that things start developing. She was completely unconscious and coma, could not breathe by herself, had tubes in there for breathing, and uh, they had a feeder and so forth intravenously. And on the 15th of January, the Feast of the Founder, she asked for a pad to write by signs. And then she wrote that she wanted something to eat, she wanted something to drink, and so forth. What would you like to say to this crowd about Arnold James? Well, first and foremost, I hope they will call me Blessed Arnold Johnson and St. Arnold Johnson. I call him Papa Arnold Johnson. So what would I like to say to you about me? Well, I, I wish that all of us gathered here today would have a model of Papa Arnold. Because I do believe that Papa Arnold's faith is something to be related. His great dependence, his complete dependence, and his divine providence and God's will is something that we should all have in our hearts and in our everyday lives. Because I do believe that if only all of us could have that strong faith that Papa Arnold has, this world will just be a brighter and a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the morning of October 5th, 2003, some 30,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square for the canonization ceremony. Conditions were ideal. Besides Arnold and Joseph, Daniel Camboni, founder of the Camboni Missionaries, was also elevated to the communion of saints. His work had been a dedicated life of service to the people of sub-Saharan Africa. Conducted in Italian, German, and Latin, the ceremony was impressive. As you know, I can celebrate it with uh, the rest of our SVDs uh, at the canonization. And when you saw the people, they were all different nationalities, all different ethnic groups, all different uh, languages, and so forth. I felt grateful because the work had been completed and that all this process that had taken place before was definitely worthy the work that was put into it for that occasion and that it was a great honor and blessing to our society.
A relic is mostly used as to promote the veneration of the saints and to have the people realize the importance of such a person in their own private spiritual life. And uh, the relics are first class and second class. Luckily, we have first class relics of many of the founder because they're taken from the bone. But for phrenotomates, we only have a second class relic and that is from his hair. When he was a young priest, one of his relatives used to cut his hair and she cut off a lock of hair and saved it, a feeling that, well, she wanted some remembrance of him since he was going to China and leaving and so forth. So uh, at first uh, she didn't want to give him up, but now she gave him to him. We have quite a few relics. His body was completely destroyed by the communists in China and there was nothing, there was nothing left. They burned, what was left they burned, even the coffin and everything. The cemetery was completely destroyed and now they finally found the place where he had been buried and then they put up another stone, uh, headstone, just a few yards over to commemorate that. that from every nationality, from every language group, or e every ethnic group, one person would come up after the gospel had been read to touch the book, to show the many faces in one heart.
The next day, the magnificent Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls was the setting for a mass of thanksgiving. Once again, thousands gathered to remember the new saints and affirm that there is one heart and many faces. We didn't expect that many people there either. And the thing is that they thought, well, they wouldn't even fill up the middle aisle. Well, it went back to the doors and they even had to put chairs on the side in order to, to uh, accommodate some of the others that came in later. We never expected that many people to be there for that celebration. Same way with uh, priests and bishops and consolidates. The gigantic basilica was filled to capacity. The 295 voice choir was present along with the Young People's Orchestra. The gospel choir sang along with a Chinese and an Indonesian choir. SVD bishops from throughout the world were present. Cultural contributions were a highlight of the liturgy. Father Tony Pernia, Superior General, gave the homily in which he stressed that our greatest tribute to Saints Arnold and Joseph was to live and work for the gospel. He thanked all present in four languages. The gathering of so many people from distant and varied places was truly awesome. The sight of such a diversity of people speaking many languages was a sign that cultures can cross over to others. For the SVD, the words, the world is our family, was more than fitting. After the Mass, there was a short audience with the Pope, and then there was an open house for all pilgrims at the Generalate, which is the administration center for the society. At this event, there was a lively presentation of music by the Gospel Choir from the Southern United States. It was a wonderful way to end a perfect day. I tell you, the people responded. I mean, they were like on us, like white on rice. They really enjoyed it. I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, they're they are people of appreciation. Um, it's totally different than, than down south. You know, some of us down south, and I'm including myself, we take for granted, you know, each other. But d up here is just totally different. I mean, that, there is something that these guys don't get often. You know, and then uh, they, they hear this group coming from the south, like they call, the, uh, call us uh, the gospel choir from uh, USA. 
And um, they were really, really, really thrilled to hear uh, uh, the sounds and, and, and the music that we had to bring to them. It was very impressive and very moving to see such a large group of different nationalities, different languages, different ethnic groups, and all participating with the, with a joy mm -hmm. and enthusiasm. God's approval was much in evidence on the day Pope John Paul II canonized these men as saints of the church. For people throughout the world joyfully claimed these two as their own. To see priests, brothers, and sisters from a variety of cultures, speaking numerous languages, sharing their gifts and talents was truly a powerful reminder to the world that God approves of the work begun with these two saints. Those who attended from the United States felt this one heart, many faces. God has blessed Saints Arnold and Joseph. Their example even now has something for the world today. God wants us to embrace all our brothers and sisters. What a different world we would have if we could see God in the faces of people throughout the world. God is one heart, many faces. May the darkness of sin and the night of unbelief vanish before the light of the Word and the Spirit of grace. And may the heart of Jesus live in the hearts of all.